Brendan Moore. So he is from South Carolina. He was born in Aiken and raised in South Carolina his whole life. Um, he did his undergraduate at the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. And he spent two years in Germany on a Fulbright scholarship teaching in a gymnasium. Um, during TAM, he interned at the Senator Shaheen's office and the Bertelsmann Foundation, uh, and he was on the German Turkish Front. And then after graduating from TAM in 2019, um, he went on to go work at the Bertelsmann Foundation, which is a think tank in DC. Uh, one of the largest media companies in the world. He now works as a project manager on German-American relations and has been featured in the Washington Post, Politico, Reuters, The Guardian, and more. And just some fun facts, he knows how to play the bagpipes and the bassoon, and his favorite movie is The Shawshank Redemption. His favorite Disney, <laughs> his favorite Disney movie is Mulan. <laughs> yep. oh, and God. it's Brandon. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, yes, yeah, Sarah, thank you so much to you and your and your team here for organizing this event. It's great to be back at Chapel Hill. Um, we did this event last year and it was unfortunate that we couldn't do it in person. So I really wanted to make, make sure we could do it in person this year. Um, yeah, absolute pleasure to be back. I forgot how hot and humid it is down here. <laughs> Suit, wrong choice, um, but I'm happily uncomfortable at the moment. So <laughs> good to be back. Um, yeah. As Mia and Nicole mentioned, my name is Brandon Bourne. I work as a project manager at the Bertelsmann Foundation. We, we are the US arm of the Germany-based um, Bertelsmann Stiftung uh, that has offices in Gütersloh, very small town in North Rhine-Westphalia, and then Berlin as well. Um, we were founded in 2008 and focus primarily on transatlantic relations. And at the foundation, I manage our German-American relations project and other projects on the greater transatlantic relationship since this year, the Transatlantic Trends 2021 that we'll talk about today. Um, yeah, so just a brief background on the project itself. Transatlantic Trends is an annual uh, survey publication started by the German Marshall Fund of the United States, GMF. It's a very large transatlantic think tank based in Washington with several offices in Europe. Um, and yeah, this project, uh, provides a detailed picture of transatlantic public opinion on core and contemporary issues. Uh, it ran for several years in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s. Then there was about a six year break and was reinstated in 2020. And that was the same time that the Bertelsmann Foundation was brought on as a partner. So I've had the pleasure of working on this project for the past two years. Um, yeah, it's truly transatlantic in, in uh, you know, it's, it's thematic focus, but also in its production. So we, of course, are a German company based in the United States. We worked primarily with the uh, GMF Paris office. Uh, we had three other main partners on this project, the Business Council of Canada, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and then the uh, uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung based in Ankara, their Ankara office. It helped immensely with the, uh, with the Turkey results that we, that we um, received. Uh, Transatlantic Trends 2021, this edition, includes the results of surveys conducted in 11 countries, representing all corners of the transatlantic community. Uh, the countries are Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Poland, Spain, Sweden, Turkey, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. Huge increase from the 2020 edition. Uh, we had three countries, only three countries in last year's edition, France, Germany, and the U.S., so we were able to increase it pretty substantially. And uh, yeah, the publication this year is divided into five chapters. They are the Transatlantic Relationship, International Security and Defense, Trade, Economic, and Technology Policies, Relations with China, and then Global Challenges. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, perfect. So briefly on the methodology, uh, polling was conducted online over a two week period in April of this year, first two weeks of April. Thousand people aged 18 years and older in each country. The results are weighted for age, gender and region in all countries and certain countries according to income and occupation. Uh, the survey consists of 22 questions uh, some of which have multiple parts or have follow-up questions, depending on how you answer. So naturally, we would be here for 
a very long time if I went through each of those uh, questions, decided to condense that into you know about a 20 to 25 minute presentation with the, uh, with the key results. Um, so I'll be brief. Um, the main focus of this presentation will be on uh, areas of cooperation and perceptions among allies, uh, security and defense, economic relations, and perceptions of China. Lots back in, I'll be brief, and uh, of course we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Okay. In the first question, we asked respondents to rank the US, China, the EU, and Russia in terms of global influence. Total figures show that on average, 62% of all respondents believe the US is the most influential global actor. Compared with 20% for China, 14% for the EU, and just 4% for Russia. We can see pretty clearly that Americans are most likely to believe the US is the most influential actor, 81%. It's a view not shared as enthusiastically among the other countries surveyed. Uh, particularly interesting are the views of France, Italy, and especially Germany, uh, the three largest EU member states and largest European NATO members. We see that only uh, between 51 and 56% of respondents in those countries find the US to be uh, the most influential global power. In last year's survey, we conducted polling before and after the COVID-19 outbreak. Polling was conducted in January and May of 2020. Uh, perceptions of U.S. influence on the global stage decreased by around 10 to 15 percentage points in the second round of surveying, so after the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, despite the administration change, um, those figures have not returned to the pre-pandemic levels that we recorded in January of 2020. And that detail was probably the most popular of the media mentions that we received this year ahead of Biden's trip to Europe in June. We also see an interesting generational divide on this question um, in almost all countries surveyed. Uh, older respondents are most likely to indicate the US than younger ones, or more likely to indicate the US than younger ones, um, who are more likely to indicate China. So there's a generational divide among the 11 countries surveyed. Okay. Um, in this question, we asked respondents to select the most influential country in Europe. Um, probably comes as no surprise to anyone here in this uh, in this room, but or joining us virtually. Uh, but sixty percent of all respondents indicated Germany, uh, compared with nineteen percent for the UK and seven percent for France. Uh, the highest figures come from Spain. Or these are for for Germany, Spain eighty one percent, Italy seventy nine percent, and Poland seventy five percent. Interestingly. Uh, the US and Canada were most likely, were more likely to choose the UK over Germany. Uh, in the US case, that finding is consistent with our 2020 findings. Answers in the UK and Turkey are also more varied than those of uh, EU member states, um, although a clear plurality in both countries finds Germany to be the most influential power on the continent. We also asked respondents to indicate the reliability of the other 10 countries surveyed. Um, and just quickly to save a moment's time, there's a lot going on in this graph here. Um, uh, going from left to right is how each country along the, uh, yeah, going from left to right is how each country perceives the other 10 countries surveyed. Uh, going from top to bottom is how each country is perceived by the other 10 countries surveyed, just to save you a moment, because we won't stay on here for too long. Um, yeah. Uh, once also one small note is that the EU, EU is, is included on here. It was included for non-EU member states. Of course, the EU is not a country and was not presented as such in surveying. This is a small mistake when creating this graph. You try, you can't catch them all, uh, but just wanted to flag that for you. Um, yeah, Canada is clearly perceived as the most reliable partner at 75%, followed by Sweden and Germany at 73%. Uh, moving down, you can see that the US, the UK, Poland, and Turkey round out the bottom of countries perceived as reliable partners. Uh, the case of Poland is quite interesting in that Poles largely consider their European neighbors to be reliable, yet its neighbors don't reciprocate that same 
uh, perception. And as you can see clearly at the, at the very bottom, uh, neither the Turks nor the respondents in other countries find the other to be reliable. Uh, in the case of the EU, while the US and Canada have generally positive perceptions of Brussels reliability, the same feeling uh, is not shared by respondents in the UK um, and Turkey. Now, just a quick deep dive into the US results. Um, for the US, we see mixed views of perceived reliability. An average of 60% of respondents believe the US to be reliable. We see a high of 76% of polls, a figure that we can confidently attribute to the close Polish-US security relationship. We also see a survey-wide low of just 23% of Turks. Notably, only 51% barely a majority of Germans believe the US to be a reliable partner. When we first released this publication, it coincided with President Biden's first trip across the Atlantic to visit Europe. We, a trip that was generally lauded as a successful restart on transatlantic relations. At that time, we anticipated these figures to go up. Again, these, these figures are from April of this year, but in the wake of what's taking pl place in Afghanistan currently, we would anticipate that trend to sort of reverse itself. Um, yeah, again, first two weeks of April this year. So it's important to keep that in mind when looking at the, at the results in this presentation as you read the, uh, the publication. Okay. What are the most important issues for transatlantic cooperation? Uh, the top items among all respondents are climate change at 37%, global health nearly equal at 36%, and the fight against terrorism at 32%. Perceptions differ greatly among the countries surveyed. For example, while climate change ranks as the top item for transatlantic cooperation overall, it doesn't feature in the top three concerns for Poles nor Turks. Americans have a more multipolar view of the most important challenges, a four way tie between the top three items listed here in the graph and the protection of human rights. The Italians, Spaniards, Turks clearly rank global health as the most important issue for transatlantic cooperation, while the French uh, indicated the fight against terrorism. Terrorism was also a top priority for the Swedes. Um, across all countries, relations with Iran and Russia were the lowest prioritized areas of transatlantic cooperation. Younger respondents are most likely to indicate climate change or the protection of human rights, older respondents are most likely to indicate terrorism. And uh, this is the case, especially in the US, France, Sweden, and Italy. There are noticeable yet predictable political divides. Uh, far right parties like the German Alternative for Germany uh, or the Dutch Party for Freedom are more likely to indicate migration or terrorism. Uh, classic liberal parties like the German Free Democratic Party, FDP, are most likely to indicate trade. Uh, green parties, as you would anticipate in Germany, Canada, the Netherlands, and France, all clearly prioritize uh, transatlantic, a transatlantic approach to combating climate change. And in the US case specifically, Republican respondents are most likely to indicate terrorism. Democratic respondents are most likely to indicate climate change. Moving on to security, overall, Majorities in all countries surveyed consider NATO important. Uh, this trend is consistent with the 2020 edition. Overall, 67% believe NATO is important in the security of their country. As you can see, Poland sticks out at the top of the list, um, along with the UK and the Netherlands close behind. French and Swedish respondents are most likely to question NATO's importance. In the US, that figure is 64%. That's the very important and somewhat important added together. Uh, strangely for this question across demographics within countries, there's a striking uh, homogeneity with a few exceptions. The importance of NATO finds consensus independent of age, uh, political affiliation, education, region, or income. In a closely related question, we asked respondents how they felt about US involvement in the security and defense of Europe. Uh, again, majorities in all countries support such involvement. 
uh, support and skepticism nearly mirrors the results of the graph shown here. Um, although Turkish support for US military involvement in Europe is far lower than the other countries surveyed. Take a quick sip of water. This is challenging. <laughs> Again, suit, wrong choice. <laughs> All right. On the issue of military involvement in the Middle East, a uh, slight plurality in all countries wishes to decrease involvement compared with 33% for maintaining and 9% for increasing. While 23% of Turks and 14% of Americans want to increase involvement, less than 10% of respondents in all countries agree. Americans are split on this issue. Uh, Democrats and Republicans gave remarkably similar answers like anything seen in the rest of the publication. Um, they appear to be split on this issue. 33 and 34% uh, would like to decrease military involvement, 34 and 35% maintain, 16 and 17% increase. So remarkably similar answers on all three um, of those. If respondents indicated that they wanted their government to decrease military involvement in the Middle East, they were asked why. Uh, most indicated that foreign intervention should be generally reduced over not getting expected results too costly or the responsibility of other states. So these were predetermined options that respondents could choose from. Okay, we also asked respondents if they supported closer transatlantic economic cooperation. Uh, countries belonging to EU member states were asked uh, sorry, countries, non-EU member states were asked if they supported closer economic relations between uh, their country and the US. EU member states were asked if they supported economic cooperation between the EU and the US. Uh, so overall, majorities in all countries support closer economic cooperation, an average of 72%. Uh, that Again, that's the somewhat support and strongly support added together. Um, just 15% oppose such cooperation. Spain, Poland, and Italy round out the most supportive countries, Turkey, Sweden, and France the least, although there's still majority support in all countries surveyed. Generally, older respondents, respondents with higher levels of education, high earning respondents, these three groups are more supportive of closer economic cooperation. And uh, like a couple of the other uh, questions in this survey, overall support is consistent with our 2020 findings, the trend is at least. Okay, moving on to China. We also asked respondents how they felt about China's influence in global affairs. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, China has received growing attention within the transatlantic community. We saw in the 2020 edition that perceptions of China's global influence rose shortly after the pandemic outbreak. So again, the pre and post results that we, uh, that we recorded. Um, also negative views of China's global influence increased by double digits across, across the board really. Uh, those views have stayed consistent in this year's survey. Overall, 56% of all respondents view China's influence negatively compared with 25% uh, with positive perceptions. Positive perceptions are slightly higher in Turkey, Poland, and Italy, between 34 and 36% respectively, all countries that are part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. And positive assessments reach its peak in Spain at 37%. Another specific data point picked out by the German media especially were the results coming from Germany, of course. Despite Germany's robust economic relationship with China and approaches to cooperate on many of the, the items listed um, in, the, in the next question that we'll, we'll, uh, we'll focus on. Uh, there were, uh, there's a, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, the highest negative views are coming from Germany, which is showing this disconnect potentially between the government's policies and the wishes of the general public. And that's really the point of this survey. It's, it's a, it's a public opinion survey. So oftentimes you can see where there are divergences between maybe the direction that a government's taking and the wishes of its people. 
Younger respondents in all countries have more positive views of China's global influence than older ones. Uh, negative views increase with age. Um, interestingly, there's a huge generational divide on this question um, between the youngest age bracket, which is 18 to 24 years old, and the oldest age bracket, those aged 55 years and older. Um, just to pick out one data point specifically, or two technically, 39% um, of respondents aged 18 to 24 in the US have negative views of China compared with 83% of those aged uh, 55 years and older. Interestingly, political affiliation did not impact views of China, or, or did impact views of China, just not on the typical left-right spectrum, as you see in a lot of uh, questions in the survey. Uh, Republican respondents, uh, supporters of the Italian Five Star Movement, Germany's Greens, and the liberal conservative um, Moderaterna in Sweden have uh, more negative views than respondents um, from other political parties in their respective countries. Okay. Overall, respondents believe their country should take a tougher approach to China. Uh, respondents had the ability to choose from six different topics. They were climate change, cybersecurity, uh, trade, technological innovation, territorial expansion, and human rights. And of the six topics presented in the survey, we see that respondents prioritize human rights, cybersecurity, and climate change, 62%, 57%, and 56%, respectively. French, French respondents are clearly in favor of taking a tougher approach to China in all domains, while Turkish respondents have rep uh, repeatedly, excuse me, while Turkish respondents favor maintaining the status quo on most issues. Although the US and Europe have repeatedly confirmed willingness to cooperate on climate change and on China, European and American public opinion on the preferred approach um, diverge a bit. Uh, two thirds of respondents in France, Sweden, Germany, Spain, and Italy favor a tougher approach compared with just 46% of Americans, 20 percentage point difference. But despite that point specifically, uh, generally, you know, I, I wish I could have put all six graphs on. It's a bit cluttered. Looks, it would just, it's a little all over the place. So if once you look at it, you can tell that there's clearly consensus that taking a tougher approach to China is the preferred, preferred course of action on most areas surveyed on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. Now, again, just a snapshot of the main results, select number of questions. Um, and you know, we of course want to provide room for you to explore the publication on your own. There are a lot of um, a lot of interesting uh, sections that we unfortunately weren't able to cover completely. And for those joining digitally, first time doing a hybrid event, so I'm trying to you know, yes. If you would like a physical publication, I'm happy to send one as well. If you send a uh, an email address, happy to send uh, directly to you. So thank you very much and. Yeah, happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so it's really important to, to take a look on a country by country basis and see what was happening at the time when surveying was conducted. In France this year, France, uh, French respondents were the most likely to indicate combating terrorism as the top priority for transatlantic cooperation. And of course, it's fallen a bit out of the news cycle uh, in, the, in the past several months, but there were a series of terrorist attacks in France earlier this year. So, you know, typically that's, that's what you'll see when something's happening in the news cycle or something's taking place generally in a country, um, you know, those, those events will typically impact public opinion. So I can say in the, in the French case, that's, that's what we think there. Hi. Yeah, um, my name is Bruce. Hi. I'm just wondering, uh, how were those Olympic countries? Very good question. A um, couple of reasons. So of course, going back to 2020, that was probably the biggest criticism that we faced with the 2020 edition, just having three countries. 
and then talking about transatlantic public opinion as if like these countries are the ones that were, you know, they're the only ones represented and spoke for everyone else. So we did our best <laughs> and expanded it to 11 countries. So big increase, but, you know, ideally you would want to have all 27 EU member states. Um, but, you know, in, in, in part, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a question of budget. You know, the more countries that you have, the more cost that's associated with uh, including them for one, just practically. Uh, I'd like to say it was to save ourselves from the torture. When you go through these Excel documents and you get them back, I mean, it's, it's a lot of data, a lot of numbers, just a lot to go through. But ideally we would wanna have a lot more countries included. I think maybe in next year's survey, maybe having the Baltic states included in some capacity. I know we talked about having Romania included in this year's survey, but ultimately wasn't included, I think for budgetary reasons. Um, but I think we did a decent job of including different corners. Of course, including Turkey was important for us this year. And we got results that were, that were interesting, uh, including Poland was especially interesting for us. You have the North, South, uh, West and at least Central Europe recognized. So hopefully next year we're able to include more Eastern European countries. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Perfect. The first question was, what explains the uh, the the results that that individuals um, chose chose uh, terrorism? Uh, in, in their country. And then I think the second one was why, uh, w w how the countries were chosen in the first place and why Eastern European countries were not included. Is that, was that correct? Okay, good to go. <laughs> and I'll be sure to repeat moving forward. Hi. Uh, yeah, so in a polarized political climate, uh, like the US or France, for example, um, how do you make sure in the polls that you have all we include all sides of this political spectrum. So mm -hmm. um, not only democratic views, but also on the Republican or like more conservative side. Um, Cause I saw that like, for example, on climate change in the US uh, over 40% want more action from the government mm -hmm. and like 20% want at least somewhat more action. And I would think it doesn't really go in line with like um, the political views. Um, so I was wondering how the methodology is for the Berkeley Foundation in this case. Yes, so methodological question. Um, we, of course, have the, the results weighted. Um, we have different political uh, respondents can indicate their political, their political views. Um, how is it checked, basically, methodologically? Um, so that's part of the reason that we outsource for this type of project. And it's the main cost that's associated with a project like this. We use the service services of a company called Kantar. Um, and really the, the amount of work that goes into writing it, writing a survey publication like this and uh, going through the data um, is just as long as the, as the time when you're actually creating the questionnaire. Um, you, it's, it's a very, very much a back and forth process where you're working with experts in this field um, to make sure that, you know, you're asking, asking questions in the, in the proper way that, you know, there isn't a leading question or something like that. Um, but in terms of political affiliation, it's interesting that you, you mentioned France um, specifically in your question, because when you go into the Excel files, you'll, and you go through the tabs, when you get to the sections that indicate the political preferences of the respondents, in some cases, you have um, you know, a respondent belonging to sort of a very fringe party. And it looks as though, you know, and that, that person of course doesn't speak for everyone belonging to that political, you know, to that political party. So when you see a result like that, you can automatically say, okay, we, we're not gonna include this in the analysis. It's not statistically relevant or whatever, you know, significant. So in those cases, if there are any questions we typically would go back to Kantar and cross check and say, you know, this is something that we found. Is this, can we indeed say this in the publication? There's a, there's very much a back and forth process with the experts who are, you know, overseeing the methodology of the publication. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay.
let's Siobhan, right? Okay, read the bio. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if that filters up or is it true at like a policy level as well? Um, and if so, how does that affect policy? Because it's probably not the case. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to reformulate this. Uh, the views that Americans and Canadians from a public, you know, public opinion view the, the uh, United Kingdom as the most, or Americans and Canadians view the United Kingdom as the most influential, influential European actor. Does that translate to policy making at the, okay. Um, typically when we go back to last year's survey, cause we did ask this question last year, the United States was included, the US indicated, Americans indicated uh, the United Kingdom at that time as well. And we also had pre and post COVID results for that question. Because the first time we got it, we were thinking, okay, but, uh, it's a bit confusing, right? For anyone you know, studying European relations, you kind of have to scratch your head a little bit. Um, but we asked the question once again in May of 2020, and we got the same results. And of course we have them this year as well. Um, last year, we, we talked a little bit about, of course, you know, there's a questioning, why, why is this the case? Um, some of the, some of the options that were presented were one, of course, there's a strong cultural relationship between the US, Canada, the UK, culturally, linguistically. Um, another interesting um, point that was made was there's a, when you're consuming news in the United States or maybe even Canada, I'm not sure, but I can say relatively confidently in the US case, um, when you're getting news about Europe, you're typically getting it from an English language source. Um, you know, BBC, or if you're watching Fox News or CNN, typically your European correspondent is going to be someone from the UK. So there's like that way that you process information could explain why you see this, you know, why you see the results that you see. Um, from, from a policy perspective, of course, the US, Canada, and the UK are closely aligned in many different areas. But yeah, there's a it's, it's always tough with a publication like this. It's part, in part, it's fun because you can kind of theorize about why is this the case? At the end of the day, it's um, basically impossible to say, you know, cause and effect. Why, why did we get these results? But fun to theorize. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, no, please. I'm, I'm coming to you next. I'm sorry. No, no, please. Um, well, I wanted to uh, focus on the finance question. Yes. Um, there's with uh, generally high levels of uh, anti Chinese uh, sentiments, with the US and Germany as the most China skeptic. Um, and similarly, pro American sentiment in Chinese youth has dropped from around 40% to 10% in just seven years. Um, but you mentioned there's lots of cooperation with China on policy, such as climate change. Um, so, my question is how important is the transatlantic relationship with China? How do you see the future of that? And um, how important is public opinion versus actual policy? Okay, so how important is the transatlantic relationship with China? Um, the last, the second follow up question. Um, and how important is public opinion versus actual policy? How important is public opinion versus actual policy? Um, yeah, okay, so. Yeah, let's see here. Um, of course, I mean, so we, I'll, I'll give you just, just an idea here. Um, when, when using this publication in recent weeks, we've been doing a series of congressional briefings where we speak with mainly foreign defense policy advisors on the Hill. The most, the most questions that I receive from staffers on the Hill is about China and about transatlantic cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China, um, towards China with the, with the European, you know, transatlantic cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China. And you know, it's, it's certainly a topic of interest. And I think really, you know, for, from an economic perspective, but also may, really a security perspective, there's, uh, you know, all eyes are moving in that direction. Um, it's, it's a, the, the section on China in, in the, uh, in the publication, there are a few different areas that, you know, we, we talk about actual cooperation that could take place between 
Europe and the United States or generally trend, the transatlantic community. And there's, uh, there's generally public appetite for doing so. Of course, one of the issues is that, you know, finding consensus between the United States and Europe and then within Europe itself there, I mean, as you saw, um, or as you heard earlier, with the results coming out of, um, out of Europe, there are varied opinions about best approaches to China or, um, you know, general areas of, you know, cooperation. There's, there's, there are divergences there and it makes making a, you know, finding consensus in Europe is difficult. So, you know, the public opinion is absolutely important um, when, it, when it comes to, to looking at these issues. Um, the point of this publication really is to show, and as I mentioned earlier, that in some cases there are divergences between how general publics would prefer their governments to act versus what the actual policies of the governments are. Um, and this serves as a tool for policymakers in that regard. A policymaker could take this publication and say, okay, you know, there, there's a disconnect here. And we've seen that happen. We had an event back in June this year um, on the Germany results specifically. We had a uh, former US ambassador to Germany, uh, John Emerson during the Obama years, um, current uh, Canadian uh, DCM uh, at, the, at the Canadian embassy in Berlin. And there were several, I, I won't mention names of course, but there were, there were members of government there who, who said, hey, you know, this is a helpful tool that we can use. You know, there were, they were pointing out the disconnects between how, between German public opinion and the policies of the government currently. So that's, you know, you, you'll have individuals who say, well, public opinion, who cares? You know, but really that we, we can confirm that policymakers have used this in the past to, you know, inform at least, you know, their, their understanding of policymaking moving forward. So I'm just gonna come here for once. Yeah, I, uh, I remember reading some article about the 2016 Right. Okay, yeah. Um, so the question was, you know, looking at the polling debacle from the 2016 election that polling ultimately uh, didn't predict what the actual results of the election would be because of demographic uh, shortcomings or methodological shortcomings. Did we experience something similar here where certain demographics were not responding to questions or some, something, is it kind of along those lines? Okay. Um, yeah, I, so again, you know, you, you, you work with, a, with a, a professional organization that does this, you know, day in and day out. So, you know, from a methodological perspective, they're the ones who, you know, they, they make sure that, you know, as, as you saw in the methodology slide earlier, you know, the, the uh, results are weighted for age, gender, re, you know, region according to country, um, income, uh, education. So it's, yeah, one, one indication that a demographic might not feel comfortable answering something is the I don't know section. Um, it's, it's not clearly shown in the graphs that you saw earlier, just because it kind of looks cluttered, but it is included in the graphs typically. Um, there's an I don't know section. Um, and, you know, in some cases last year, we had, uh, it, it's always a, it's, it's a balance that you have to play. It's a fine line between including information, questions, responses that people can choose from that are, that are, too, that are specific and those that are just too general. You want to find that comfortable middle ground because as you ask questions that become more and more specific, you might see those I don't know start to increase. So for example, but they might have an opinion about it. They might just not understand the way in which the, the, uh, the question's being asked. To give you an example, in the 2020 version, we asked um, respondents about um, security related challenges. And uh, one, of the, one of the responses that uh, uh, respondents could choose from was um, 
military involvement in the Sahel, the Sahel region of, of Africa. And, you know, we saw something like 40 to 45 percent, I don't know answers on that question. Even in, even in a country like France, which of course is actively involved in that region of the world. So, you know, the, the words you choose, the way in which you ask questions is very important to avoid, you know, getting, getting, getting results like that. I hope that answers the question a bit, but we also, again, rely on methodological experts to make sure we're, we're good to go um, with the results we're getting. Okay. Okay. Is it? Oh yeah. Okay. Hey, Brian. I know you. Hello. Hey there. So I have a question about um, on your most influential actors in international affairs graph. Um, the UK is the country that by far thinks, or one of the that thinks the EU is more influential than China, and the one yeah. that thinks that that by the furthest amount. Um, so I'm wondering one, how that changes versus past years if you know, and two, how that breaks down like demographically, because the EU's relationship with the UK has definitely changed the most recently. So it's interesting how they have that more than. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was other um, EU members. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry. Could you repeat the last part? Oh, um, so I, yeah, I just, because because they have had the most rocky relationship with the EU, I thought it was interesting that they are the ones that favor them over China by the largest amount among the other EU countries old. Um, and so I'm wondering how that breaks down demographically and over, over time. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. And a, and a very specific point to point out, you know, it was, it was something that we found very interesting as well. And it actually features in the, in the written analysis um, in the publication. Um, yeah, going back to last year, unfortunately, the UK wasn't included in that survey. So we can't see how it we can't see the the year to year change, unfortunately. Uh, last year we only had France, Germany, and the United States. But um, yeah, in this year the demographic breakdown. I honestly I I can't say exactly, but I I can definitely get back to you with those results. And also for everyone here, you know, if you're interested, I'd be happy to provide the Excel sheets themselves. If you want to comb through them yourselves, and if you're interested or just want to have an idea of how this whole thing works, um, you know, you can you can have a look for yourself, but I can get back to you on that. I can't remember the exact demographic breakdowns on that answer specifically. Um, my apologies. Um, Katerina, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have a question. So um, on page 13, it says that only 50% on average of Germans perceive the US as a reliable partner. Um, I don't have the facts, but I feel like that number might have been higher in the past, maybe. Um, what is your personal opinion on why that number might have come down to 50% besides one potential reason being the Trump administration, maybe? And then also, um, what's your take on the role of the media in Germany? Like, how would, have, how would that have affected that number? Like, yeah. an example, um, being CNN. So I remember last year in Germany, CNN was the only public American news channel that you can watch for free, whereas for Fox News, for example, you would have had to pay. Interesting. Like okay. How, and then obviously, like CNN tends to be the side of things, so how would that have happened? Right. Uh, the question was, why do we see 51% uh, of, of Germans uh, find the United States to be reliable? Why is that the case? And, and the follow-up question was, um, what's the role of the media? And that in maybe impacting those those views, it's funny you you bring that up. Uh, during that event that we had back in June with Ambassador Emerson, um, you know the way that I presented it today was you know yeah, that's that's not a good number. Fifty one percent, barely a majority of Germans find the U.S. to be a reliable partner. And during that event, uh, Ambassador Emerson actually jokingly said, "Well, he he was serious, but said so in a sort of funny way." That's an improvement, folks. Saying, you know, 51%, if we, you know, polling had been conducted a year or two prior during the Trump administration, as you mentioned, we might see that 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 figure go down quite a bit. Um, that was his, as you mentioned. So um, for for him, he was saying, you know, actually that's that's kind of an improvement from where we were just maybe a year or two ago. 
Um, whether that's the case, we unfortunately don't have year to year results and can't you know, cross check and say like, this is exactly what happened. Um, in the case of the German media, you know, it's, um, it's tough to say, it's all sort of theorizing and speculating, but you know, I, I, from anyone who's spent time in, 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 uh, in, in Germany, in this room, which is probably, you know, a, a large number of you actually I've read your bio, so I kind of know, <laughs> but, um, you know, generally, yeah, I, at least from my experience there, having lived there for several years during when Trump came to power in 2016, I was there, um, you know, generally the coverage of the United States is generally negative, I would say, um, if you were to go to Spiegel or Stan or, you know, whatever sort of, even ma major um, news sites, you would typically see an article about Trump on the first page when you went on. Now, again, it's speculative. It's not <laughs> statistically relevant. There's no relevance to what I'm saying, but generally, you know, I would say that that, uh, you know, is, is the case and yeah. impacts public opinion. And I might have mispriced that. What I was trying to oh, okay. say was, um, as compared to like the Obama- effect, Oh, sure, like, sure, absolutely, example, but, absolutely. Like, Germans Definitely so. And there's, we unfortunately don't have it in our publication. You're absolutely right that during the Obama years, you would have seen it go up. Although, you know, 2013 NSA, you know, that, that certainly negatively impacted uh, the US German relationship. Um, you know, there, there is polling out there where you can see it go down or go, it was high during the Obama years and then, you know, go down during the Trump years. So, no, you're absolutely right there. Please. Um. This is it's super interesting. I studied psychology and economics undergrad, so I did a lot of like social science experience. Um, but we've also like privy to the really big sort of reckoning that's going on, especially in psychology, about just the validity of survey findings, how sure. they're conducted, um, and then how much nuance is also lost with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that in mind, like I know that there's a sort of a contract from doing this, and we just hope that they're and we know that they're doing. The best that they can. Yeah. Um, but these are also being presented to like ambassadors and really high level US officials. Sure. Um, are there any questions that you feel like hide nuance or that you're kind of like less enthusiastic about talking about um, or feel like just need some caveats? Uh, interesting point. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, at the end of the day, the people who are working on these surveys, some of them have backgrounds in statistics specifically. I'm sure a number of you are taking uh, courses with Dr. Jenkins, so you're going to have, you know, or maybe you already have backgrounds in statistics as well. Um, you know, that's we 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 have to rely on methodological experts for for these for these things, and that's why you spend so much time working on the questionnaire and working on okay, what what are some potential red flags here or even yellow flags where you could get results that, you know, are just, you know, not exactly what you were mentioning. So um, when it comes to certain results, I mean, I, I can't say so exactly. Um, there are some cases where, you know, when the United States, for example, is included in the question, good example, the international security and defense chapter. One question is about uh, the role of NATO in like how important is NATO in security and defense of your country? And the follow-up, the, the next question in the list is how involved should the United States be in the security and defense of Europe? You could arguably say that's the same question. Not, not exactly, but of course the United States is, plays an integral role in NATO, which is involved in the security and defense of Europe. So when you present the United States in a question, typically you'll see less support in some ways. And we saw it in this, in this case as well. Um, for example, uh, I think the Turkey results, you saw that there's majority support for Turkey, for, for NATO and Turkey, um, clearly. But in the next question, when asked about the US role in European security and defense, Turkey is the least supportive of something like that. So there's some cases like that where you go, hmm, you know, it's important how you ask a question, it's gonna impact the results you get, yeah. Uh, Michael? Yeah, related to, to NATO and the U.S. Uh, liability, um, majority support pretty much everywhere for NATO and American support for European defense. However, last week, Borel um, proposed a 50,000 
member exited, European expeditionary force. And it might be too current of a topic, but I was wondering if you're seeing a shift away from support for NATO in the US, given our unilateralism over the past couple of years, more towards a contained EU control mechanism. Uh, good question. Um, oh, and I didn't repeat your uh, gosh. Okay. Uh, the question was uh, looking at, you know, of course, we saw that there's support, majority support for NATO in recent weeks. Um, Burrell mentioned that there would be, what was the figure again? Uh, 50,000 member European expeditionary 50,000 member European expeditionary force. So a more European approach to security defense, aside from the United States. Um, what does that mean exactly? Is that kind of the, okay. Um, yeah, I would say the polling, the, the time of polling is important. You know, if you were to see, if, if we were to take polling today or two weeks from now, maybe we would see those figures, um, be, be, you know, change a bit, especially the question on US involvement in the security and defense of Europe. Um, I think the events of Afghanistan are changing public opinion that Europeans feel that they can't necessarily depend on the United States uh, to, to act as a, you know, a partner in consultation. You know, the, that was the main, uh, and I know we have some Europeans in the audience today, that was one of the main criticisms from the European side that our European partners who were with us on the ground there were not consulted thoroughly enough, um, you know, before what's, what's taking place now. And, you know, they're unfortunately, uh, you know, experiencing some of the same difficulties that we are. Um, so, you know, in that case, I think really there, that there's been a trend towards that, that, that line of thinking that, that Europe needs to bolster its own security and defense because going back to the Trump years when there was, you know, the sort of anti-NATO, anti-European rhetoric coming from the White House that you know, there were questions starting then about, okay, can we rely on the United States to be a reliable partner, a reliable security partner in the case of your question. Um, I think the events of recent weeks are, you know, that's, for, you know, I, I, certainly sparking more questions about that reliability. Please. Uh, so my question, I have two questions in the go to the migration. Uh, yeah, okay. So the first question is, like, how has the, how, how have you seen the migration specific change in the last few years? Mm -hmm. um, basically, with things uh, becoming a little more normal and not as many lockdowns. And then my second question is more specifically, why is the Polish number for less restrictions on migration so high? Especially since we just saw that um, Poland is going to build a wall uh, on their border with Belarus. Yeah, good question. So, Nicholas, right? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, Yes, migration section. This is, uh, the question is from a section that wasn't included in the presentation today. Global challenges, there are two questions related to migration. Um, one of which is asking um, how, uh, asking respondents how their government should approach migration, take a tougher, softer approach. Um, why do we see the numbers that we see? How do they compare to last year's numbers? Why do we see that in Poland uh, there's, support for taking a less tough approach yet the policies of the government contradicted and that there's apparently a wall being proposed on the border between Poland and Belarus. Um, okay, so again, unfortunately, uh, last year we didn't have a section on migration specifically. Those questions weren't asked um, last year. So we, we, we can't see a difference next year, definitely. Um, but I think, you know, may, maybe in that case specifically, and, and it is, that's kind of, you know, it is a bit surprising that that figure, I, I'd have to cross check, but you know, if that is the case, that, that is a surprising figure considering the rhetoric coming from uh, the PIS in Poland, you know? So I, I would say that, you know, you, as you've probably noticed in recent weeks, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of talk in Europe right now about the impacts of Afghanistan on migration in Europe, refugees coming to Europe, um, you know, a, a, another surge, so to say, of Afghan refugees, um, or you know, generally, that's that's a, that's a topic in the news cycle currently. So I think maybe if we were to conduct polling now, 
you could you would maybe see those figures change a bit. Um, it's difficult to say for that figure specifically. I'm trying to think of April of this year, but that uh, yeah, I, I I really can't say. It, but in any case, it shows a disconnect between. Yeah, and, and the Bellary column, column yeah. has been going on for a while now, so I would assume it's the statistics are from April. Yeah. You already have it more than oh okay i see i see i see yeah no you're you're absolutely right that's a yeah that's a good question and something that we should probably look into yeah i can't really say was that was there was there uh, a demographic breakdown in terms of age i can't um, remember exactly i don't think so okay i, I didn't see anything with um with uh pulling uh attention there even though there's yeah it, it, the spotlight is, is on germany uh, more so than um, the Polish data. Okay, yeah, we'll have to look into that, but good question. Uh, yes, Grace. Um, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you know, on page 32, uh, citing uh, that China is more uh, favorably among younger people, so 18 to 24, um, I'm wondering why do you think that is? It, it's a good question, and it's consistent with last year's finding. Fortunately, fortunately, we do have results from, you know, we, we asked the exact same question in the 2020 version twice pre, before the pandemic outbreak and after. It's pretty much the same. Um, in January of 2020, we saw that, I'm, I'm sorry, the question was, why do we see in the 18 to 24, or younger respondents generally have more positive views of China? In January of 2020, we saw that really younger respondents were split on the question. In some cases, younger respondents had 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 actually like like pluralities of younger respondents had favorable views of, of uh, China's global influence. In the wake of the pandemic, we saw those views, you know, change completely, you know, by ten to fifteen percentage points. So there was, um, you know, there 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 was a change there as a result of you know China China's role in the pandemic. But um, you know, in this year's survey, it's it's pretty much consistent with last year's. Uh, the, the reasoning why it's, um, it's, it's really hard to say. And we, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you're, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to prove that cause and effect. I mean, you can theorize why, why is this the case, but, um, it's, I can say with certainty, it's something that, you know, for, for us in the transatlantic community, you, the purpose of our organization is to try to strengthen transatlantic relations. When you see those that those generational divides are some of the most concerning ones for, for folks in our community, because you see that, you know, the, the US European relationship of old, you know, where it was, you know, almost taken for granted is not exactly the case, maybe in the next 20 to 30 years, that relationship could look a lot different. So um, the cause and effect is unclear, but I can say with certainty that it's something that we find interesting and are looking at with concern. <laughs> Yes. Um, are you okay with the question more like the specific role? Uh, of course, yeah. Okay, so I mean, first of all, for this, like, this is really neat. Like, I was in marketing, so this is so pleasing to the eye. So, <laughs> Thanks. Um, it looks really nice. So, I'm interested in what your role in this project, the mm -hmm. report as itself, was. Um, what parts of the pro uh, parts of the um project were yours, and then generally, um your responsibilities and tasks in your role that you have right now. Okay. Um because I you obviously are an expert in German American relations. So. Somewhat. <laughs> but um yeah so the question was what was my role in this pop this project and then what is my what are the responsibilities in my role generally? Um yeah very involved in this project. Um you know, the I I work primarily with uh, Jazine Beba. I'm not sure. she, uh, she works for the GMF Paris office, and she gave a talk at George. I know did, Eric, right? And you went to Georgetown, yeah. so she gave a talk with the I think a master one of the master's programs there recently. Um, but she and I um, were the main sort of you know do, doing the dirty work, so to say. You you we have calls every week, you know, where we talk about updates. I mean. Um, you know, we spent probably two or three months just trying to figure out the fundraising, the actual funding of the project itself, um, writing the questionnaire, working with Kantar. When we actually got the results and the polling was conducted and we get the Excel sheets, you get something like 
yeah, like 11. I think yeah, it would probably be 11. I think there were actually like 22, but the 11 of them were the ones that we used the most that had the very detailed results. And they're essentially these very large Excel files that consist of 50 tabs that you go through and comb through. And in some cases, Cantor helps you out. They'll, they'll highlight uh, figures that they find interesting, that they found interesting on their own. So that kind of helps you when, when, when going through these documents, but it is a very long process. You go through these, uh, the, the results you receive, you create Excel files of your own that consolidate all of this information, make sense of it all. Um, because when you go back through it, it's just, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of time. Then what you, you know, you write the publication. So I actually drafted half of this. Yeah, so I wrote half of this. Uh, I think the first question, it wasn't exactly half and half, like the first half and the second half, but something like that. I think we took 11 questions and GMF took 11 questions of the 22 total questions included. Um, and then, you know, thank you very much for the kind remarks on how this looks. Um, it's a process creating, you know, give the, our virtual audience, like kind of the feel for like what this looks like. Here you go. All right. Um, we worked with a graphic designer based in Romania. Uh, she, we had probably a collective eight or nine hours of calls just about the graphics in this publication. I think maybe an hour of which was devoted to this cover. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, there's, when you have so many different stakeholders in a project like this, you, it's, it's a process, you know, there's a lot of compromise and con consulting. So this whole thing took, you know, from start to finish about nine months or so. It's a long process, very deeply involved in this project. Um, role generally, uh, very mixed. Again, I'm a project manager. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert. I'm not a um, sort of like a, uh, in, the, in the think tank world, you have project managers. You have fellows who typically have a certain expertise. You've got, um, you know, folks who have expert in their job description. The nature of a project manager is, you know, essentially that you're managing several different projects about a theme specifically. So this year, for example, the uh, German elections coming up next month. A lot of our projects are focused on that topic specifically, or you know, on German, on Germany and German elections. Um, just to give you an idea of the output for this year, I had a solo publication come out in, uh, I guess it was February of this year, about federalism in the United States and Germany during COVID. Uh, it was about a hundred page report. It's probably one of the bigger ones. This of course was on there related to the larger transatlantic relationship. We make infographics, we make, we do shorter 1000 word, um, so-called B briefs, Bertelsmann briefs. Um, we're actually starting next Thursday is the first, first one of these, but we're doing a six to seven part webinar series with our Stiftung colleagues in Germany about the German elections. The first one is about the future of Europe and the Eurozone in the post macro era. So that's next Thursday, September 2nd. Um, so webinar series, uh, we do animated videos. We have, um, we, and we actually make documentaries. Some of my, one of my colleagues, we actually have an in-house documentarian who makes films about uh, typically US, US issues in, in late recent years. Although uh, he and my uh, supervisor, Tony Silberfeld have made documentaries on a wide range of, wide range of European topics, mainly related to elections, the Italian elections in 2018, Latvian elections, I think maybe the year before. Um, so documentary films, the animation series, the first anime, I was mentioning this to me and Nicole yesterday, but the first one came out on Tuesday. It's called The Evolution of Germany's Political Spectrum. It's on YouTube now. <laughs> you can take a look if you'd like. Um, three part, four part series, all related to the German election. So lots of moving pieces, just made an education guide of, 14 page education guide for high schools here in the US about the German elections, the ins and outs, the, you know, the two vote ballot and how a chancellor is chosen and all of that sort of stuff. Lots of stuff. And on top, you're managing a budget of, you know, in my case, about like $75,000. And you just, you, you make sure everything, you make sure the trains run on time. That's, 
that's really the nature of the of the job. So that's that's kind of the the overview. Long answer, but yeah. yeah. Sarah, th you're welcome. My question is, I know that you did a little bit of work on the job, and when you go and spend long with it, to what extent does that really help you make the quality of uh, ability to do the well with that? And I know a lot of people who start to career, they're usually three or there. Um, so, yeah, what is that? Absolutely. So I, as me and Nicole mentioned, I did an internship um, in, a, in a senator's office for a summer during TAM. How has that experience helped me when we're, we, we've been doing these congressional briefings with this publication? Essentially consists of 15 minutes of presentation and a 15 minute Q&A. Um, how is that, how did my time on the Hill help me for what I'm doing now and generally um, career advice? Um, it, it helped. It's helped immensely. Um, when you know the inner workings of a, of a Hill office, who to contact, how to contact them. We um, fortunately just brought on another communications person uh, back in, I guess it was May of this year, who uh, came from a senator's office um, and uh, has that experience as well. I think. I think probably a third of everyone in the office, which is not saying much because it's a nine person office, but uh, you know, has experience on the Hill. My boss is a former foreign policy advisor in the, in the House of Representatives. So that, that experience definitely helps, you know, generally who's in charge of what, who's covering what, how this could be helpful. You know, when you're an intern anywhere, you'll, you'll have the opportunity to kind of understand the inner workings of an organization the nuance that's not included in the job description and understand what's important to that organization, how you can provide some sort of resource. And that's how we present it. We say, hey, like a lot of interesting data here. If you're writing a briefing or a memo of your own, this could potentially come in handy for your work. If you're writing, you know, so something along those lines, you know, the your, your ability to, to tap into the, to a congressman uh, specifically, or to a senator, like directly, that's that's a bit more difficult. Um, something that we could probably, I mean, you know, you have goals, of course, but you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's it's even better to speak with. You know, I, I spoke with a foreign uh, policy fellow who was, um, I think, I think a master's student the other day. She was the uh, the the person I briefed, and in some cases, you know, when you speak with uh, folks who are, you know, our age, a bit younger, or, you know, legislative uh, correspondence assistance, sort of lower in a in a Hill office, you know, you you're able to have a, even sometimes a better connection because they, you know, it's just a, it's a different relationship than maybe speaking with a legislative director who's been on the Hill for 20 years and has probably had hundreds of briefings like this requests. So, it's um it is helpful to know um, general career advice. As I told Mia and Nicole yesterday at dinner, um, internships are good. Internships are good. Um, don't I know you're? Yeah, you know you've uh, <laughs> you're in your first ten days of school, right? You know you've just uh, you've just started the program. You don't have to know exactly what you want to do or what your research interests are. Um, you know you don't have to know any of that yet. Um, but as you go on. It'll come naturally to a certain extent. You know, you'll figure out what you're interested in, and at that stage, it's maybe helpful to identify organizations that do what you're interested in. You know, if you if you're interested in 
you know, diplomacy, okay, the State Department has a very, you know, a very well-organized internship program, or that's just an example. Um, when I started TAM, I was, you know, I was dead set on, you know, I, I wanted to have a job when I finished. So that's why I did the two internships simultaneously. It was, you know, again, not double shifts or anything, but it was happened. I was part-time in one office, part-time in another, just trying to get in. And that's what happened. I mean, it, it, it was very fortunate. Um, when I finished TAM, I was in Berlin. It was August of 2019. I did some hardcore networking. Like I was going for it for a month, meeting with people, led to three job interviews, didn't get any of them. So sad, <laughs> definitely a low point. <laughs> but I tell you on the last day, on the day that I got the final of the three like rejection letters, it was like rejection emails. Um, my old boss called me and said, hey, want to come back. So that was, you know, just no stress. Internships are good. They can get your foot in the door. That that would be my main my main recommendation. Yes. Yeah. No. First of all, I totally agree with you. Like I, I, I guess my my internship sort of went into this. So that's yeah. Cool. And that's interesting that you mentioned this just now because I wanted to ask. So you were also political intern at the U.S. Embassy in Berlin. Yes. So how did that happen? How um did if you can recall, like how did mm -hmm. that application process go? What were the expectations to get that job? And then what were your tasks on that job being an intern at the US Embassy? Okay. Um, I was an intern at the embassy in Berlin. How did it come to be? What were the responsibilities, more or less? Okay. Um, yeah, it was before I started TAM. Oh. Um, it was the summer before I came. And it was, it was good because I had like, I could say that I was a student. So I applied and then I did it before I came. But I know plenty of people who did State Department internships while, while they were here. So, um, at least one of whom is now working for the State Department. Um, she was a presidential management fellow. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good experience. Um, it, it doesn't, it, that, that internship alone doesn't lead to a job ever. Um, that's, that's typically not going to happen. I mean, you have to go through the whole foreign service officer process. It's good experience though. And, you know, if you have time to do something like that, like it's a bit longer, the process um, as an American, you have to get a security clearance, which is a thing, you know, that you just got to do. But uh, it was a good experience overall. It was an interesting time. I was there in 2017, political section. It's right before the German election that year, um, September of 2017. So, we went to uh, several political party conferences, reported back on what was, you know, what the, what the party platforms were. Um, G20 took place in Hamburg that year. I don't know if you remember that. It was kind of a, was a I have a, an SS word in my, a, a, a cuss word in my mind right now, but it's, it's uh, it was, it was uh, not well organized. There was a bit of chaos, I'll put it that way. It was, there was a bit of chaos. And um, we ultimately, you know, we weren't able to go. It was Donald Trump's, I believe it was his first trip to Germany. So there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, it's an interesting time to be there. Um, got to see the South Korean president like 10 feet away from him before he went on to Hamburg for another event. Cool access, great access, cool internship. Would recommend if you have time to do so, but it's not necessary if you're, you know, you know, it, if, if, that's, if that's what you're interested in, great. Really, I would say this time, it's a special time in, in TAM specifically. It's a great program because you can kind of, it's, it's flexible. You can pick out your research interests and pursue them. Um, you're, not, you're not confined uh, by, you know, whatever. You, know, you, you, can, you can move in different directions and adapt with whatever interests come, to, you know, eventually evolve. So, um, that was an internship that was great, but you don't have to do so. If you're uh, going to Germany um, and you're German, which I don't know if you, I don't think you are, no? Yeah. Oh, you are? No. Okay. No. Uh, okay, good. Um, you, you can do um, internships as a German at the U.S. Embassy there. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
they're I met in, and actually I think they were they outnumbered the Americans there. Lots of staff members at diplomatic missions, the majority are what are called locally employed staff members, LES. Um, and they they're absolutely essential to the work that diplomats do when they get there because they they know the lay of the land. They they don't move on like foreign service officers do. They stay there. So they have great contacts and they're a great resource. So definitely an option for for Germans in, in the uh, in, you know in, interning for diplomatic missions in, in Germany. Yes. Yeah, I also feel like I, I guess in your bio there were also there was this mention of these two diplomatic missions in Germany. Is that is this internship one of them? That's one of them. I was at the consulate in Dusseldorf for about 10 months. It's a program that was designed basically for Fulbrighters at the time. Uh, they brought in folks um, so while, you were in ETA. while I was in ETA, exactly. And uh, that program, unfortunately, isn't happening anymore. Um, it was, there's a long story there, but um, <laughs> nothing, nothing negative with me or anything. It's just, uh, it's just not happening anymore, unfortunately. But that was, that was the experience. It wasn't as intense as the embassy experience. I was there part time. Um, didn't have a security clearance. I had like sort of the the basic, like I can't remember, like sensitive but not classified, whatever that r ranking is. Um, interesting experience though, and uh, still, of course, have those contacts today that I can rely on. We're we're still pretty close. Yeah. That's good. Hi, is it Brett. Yes. Yeah. Good to see you again. Because you were you were you were working here. Uh, no. Okay. I feel like I've met you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have in the past. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. Um. Thank you again for coming. One thing that you mentioned a very wide spread of materials and this kind of going from like the political party kind of aspect of the youth like Mr. Day and some of the youth in Germany to like on the hill kids for high schoolers. Um so kind of thinking about Burlesman more generally kind of what perhaps is Burlesman's ideal audience if that if you good question that, and then depending on that how large or small that spread is how how do you kind of still manage for Burlesman? Um, how do you see the kind of organization balancing regular way accessibility? Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, given my background, there were we have different target audiences. Is there an ideal target audience, essentially? And then start the follow-up question. And then just kind of depending, like, depending on the characteristics of that audience, how do you balance, like, analytic rigor? Like, sure. Yeah, how do you balance analytic rigor and accessibility with different target audiences? Um, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a challenge, honestly, you know, um, and it takes time, you know, on the the actual briefings, cumulative time spent doing the briefings is probably three or four hours, maybe, because you're doing it online. The actual time setting up those meetings is so much more because you're having to research, you're having to email back and forth, coordinate a time, set up a Zoom call. You know, in one case, a no show, and then you know you re reorganize it, and because you know someone forgot, it's you know there's there's a lot of time that goes into uh, you know that sort of thing. You know that you you write the report, but then the actual like communications outreach is is a whole nother. It, it's like it's, sometimes it's more work than the actual you know publication itself. Um, our target audiences vary really, um, as, as you can already tell. Um, you know, one day, yeah, briefing foreign policy advisor um, in a senator's office, and the next we're speaking with high school students about German American exchange programs. Varied, very, very different group. But you know, we we want to make it accessible. A lot of think tanks typically focus on those high level, high level. Um, those high level meetings, you know, they're, they, and they sort of, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to say look down, I'm not going to talk badly about other organizations, but generally, you know, there's, there's not as big of a push to speak with younger people. 
younger students, high schoolers, college students. And that's, I think that's a mistake, you know, it kind of, it creates a bubble of sorts where, you know, only, only a certain type of person can, can access, um, you know, this information. Um, so really we try to, we kind of, I wouldn't say pride ourselves, but we, we try to engage with younger audiences and those, the animation that you mentioned, you know, that's, it, I think it spans different age groups. Um, it's made in that way to not necessarily focus just on, on, you know, high school students, but uh, we, we gladly do so, you know, kind of looking at the, the results on, on uh, perceptions of U.S. credibility, U.S. reliability, perceptions of U.S. influence, you know, there's, there's, uh, this is the next generation. We want to make sure that, you know, these, these sorts of uh, programs are accessible to, to younger folks on both sides of the Atlantic. Yes. Um, what was your thesis about when you graduated? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. So I was in the, uh, sorry, what was my thesis about? Uh, that was the question. Um, yeah, gosh. Um, it's been a minute. Uh, yeah, no, I was in the German Turkish track. So I, yeah, like me and Nicole. Yeah, and uh, so I took Turkish while I was here. I had a class um, for, for Turkish in the first year, took two semesters. Unfortunately, the Turkey program wasn't happening at the time, but I'm glad to see that it's back and uh, you're gonna have fun, Mia. Um, yeah, so I wrote about, uh, it was German uh, Turkish voting behavior and American Turkish voting behavior comparative analysis looking at the last, at the time it was like the last uh, two elections, the 2018, um, a parliamentary election in the 2017 national referendum and just looking at, you know, how those different groups voted because uh, they vote quite, quite differently. And at the, at the, uh, the base of it, it was kind of like, well, why, why is that happening? What are the reasons for, for that happening? That was kind of the, the general focus. So American, Turkish and German Turkish voting behavior in, in domestic Turkish elections. Yeah. Sorry, I, yeah, I would have assumed you were in the Turkish track. That's how it goes, you know, just okay. all over. Um, but, and, you know, for the thesis, long way away. Don't worry. Don't stress out too much. Um, you'll have time to figure out what your research interests are. It's not something that you have to, you know, stress about now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes.